But for now, I'm just going to jump right into our speaker, um, Didi Kiso. She has a BA in journalism from San Jose State University, but she's also attended the Professional Ringman's Institute and the Worldwide College of Auctioneering. Um, Didi has founded a nonprofit organization, served as a board member, worked as an auctioneer in Spanish as well, and, uh, and is the um, founder of both Benefit Auctions and Strategies and Six Figure Fundraising. With TVNPA, she's been both a sponsor and a speaker, and we're really excited to have her here today. So welcome, Didi. Wow, thanks for having me. I love being back here, and um, it combines two of my favorite things, although we won't have a fundraiser today, but public speaking and asking other people for money. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. Who agrees? <laughs> oh, I'm with like-minded people already. So um, I've written a book, and at the end of this, I would like to, uh, you don't have to go to Amazon to get it. You can get the uh, a download on my website, and I'm so excited to share it. I wrote the book because I can't possibly talk to everybody and let them know what I'm doing one-on-one uh, -on -one in coaching, but there's empirical evidence of case studies that I've done through the years that have been quantum leaps of improvement for fundraising. So making your job easier, as well as getting greater results, greater return on investment. So I've been a business owner for many years, and I think what is missing in the nonprofit world is this, uh, you know, begging, asking for money. This nonprofit organizations, you're a business, you gotta be looking at return on investment, and how can you monetize your minutes? So, um, you want to show the big book cover? Okay. So, um, so here's the book, Fundraising in the Post-Pandemic World, Securing Long-Term Funds in the Face of Uncertainty. How does that sound to you? All of events, gathering donors, telling your story should be about looking at the long-term donor enrollment, donor gifts for your sustainability. So we're going to talk a little bit today also about what I call the donor pyramid, donor enrollment pyramid, and the diversification of income that we're not just going to chase people and treat them like they're a uh, ATM, but you want to have really meaningful partnerships. And so that's in the book. There's a wonderful chart and uh, so let, let's start like, how do I even get here? So um, we can change the camera. Thank you very much. So I got here, um, actually, you know what? I grew up in foster care. We'll go back that far. And I'm the first in my family to finish eighth grade. I put myself through college. And so I think I am so fortunate from where I've come from because when I work with organizations that serve people, I'm often the person that could have been served many years ago. So the irony is that I have the opportunity sometimes when people hire me to be an auctioneer to stand right here and invite joyful gifts to serve someone that I used to be. And so being seen and being heard, when I told I would never be seen and heard, and uh, so, that's the irony and that's the joy in what I get to do. So I'm so grateful that I found this calling and I want to share this with you. So another piece of this was after college, um, I worked in a little bit of TV news and I didn't like the people's attitude towards newsmakers. I felt it was cold and hard. And I left one day in tears with a uh, man whose son had been kidnapped, uh, the news um, reporter asked him what he thought Christmas would be like this year without his son. And when everybody in the studio laughed, that was my last day in that career. And I thought, I really need to do something where I can use these skills and, uh, and serve a community in a much higher way. I'm so happy I got to find fundraising. But being a business owner, I have taken fundraising and the way 
I look at it in a little bit of a different way. So believe me, I've had everybody's job, board member, founder of a couple nonprofits, major gift officer, um, like we talked about earlier in the introduction, and thank you for that. But I did it the really, really hard way. Like donor after donor after donor, asking for money and found this organization that we would really needed to raise money for. And they had money that I think that had been disappearing with some sticky fingers. We've all heard of that story. And so I, uh, I, I got a couple of other friends. We took over the organization and in six years, we raised a million dollars from zero. And it was just a high school booster club. <laughs> I was having the time of my life. And the first year it was terrible because I thought we'd better have a, a gala because that's what everybody does. And, uh, you know, our, our membership was all membership, right? And, you know, how many have tried to do a membership uh, group at your nonprofit because you can just give money and then uh, you got some good money coming in. But the next level of work of enrollment isn't there, right? So that's kind of what's missing. And sometimes when people buy a membership, um, they want to know what's in it for them. And they want more, more, more. Well, you don't have time to deliver all of that, right? So i um, not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's on a different level of the profit pyramid than you might think. So I knew I needed to get dads involved. So I thought we'd have a tequila tasting. Well, it worked really, really well. I just didn't know everything I needed to know to make more money. But I knew no matter what we did, if we had the first one, we could get some enrollment and tell our story. So we cleared $12,500 the first year. But in the meantime, this really cool book came out and this auctioneer woman was teaching people like me about fundraising, but with auctioneer brain. Now, why is that important? It's important because people who are professionally trained auctioneers know about marketing, pre-event marketing, and a lot of it. You're not going to show up at an auction and not know what they're selling and what you're getting into, right? So you're not throwing a gala, which is the very means party. You're having a fundraising event. So now I'm getting dangerous because this woman is now becoming my mentor and telling me everything leading up to the next event. And the next event raised $55,000 with less work because I learned a lot of shortcuts from her. So we got rid of the silent auction. Oh, do you feel that? People, are, I, I, I heard you thinking this, got rid of the silent auction. It's heavy in labor, heavy in delivery. You may not be able to collect all the money. Now you gotta chase the people down and give them their thing because they left before they, you know, all the many things. But I think as a business person, the worst thing about the silent auction is this, that as a small business owner, I'm gonna ask you for your wine, your vacation, your trips, and we're gonna sell it under fair market value. And what does that psychologically say to everybody in the room? that when I want to buy Carol's product, the best time to get it is at the next fundraiser because we'll buy it less than fair market value. So we should really be thinking about what our donors are thinking, right? Elevate everybody. So let me tell you why that teeny tiny little fundraiser raised 50, over $50,000 with a $10 per head cost, return on investment. How about that, right? $50 tickets, $10 per head. We made a load of money on tickets and every single penny we made at the event was what? Monetized minutes. And I don't have time to go into the psychological profiles of the five individuals that come to the event, but we um, made sure that we covered those in meaningful ways to let them give joyful gifts. There was never any time that it wasn't joyful and so one of the best things we did was this, a one-to-many ask. Anybody know what that is? The one-to-many ask. 
imagine, imagine this fundraising event. Imagine it's like homecoming, right? Like homecoming or all high school homecoming, coming, right? If we don't tell them what event it is, they won't know. You might be going to the parade, you might be going to the dance, you might be going to the dinner, the, the rally, the football game. So it's not just a gala. It's not the homecoming. It's a fundraising benefit to elevate the homeless. Create a greater art program for your college. We want to set the expectations so people can come with a joyful heart and you know what? If they don't want to dance, you don't go to the dance, right? But if you're coming to the fundraising event, you know you're going to be asked to dance, and that dance is an opportunity to make a joyful gift. Well, here's a case study that you'll love. I had a small school. Um, I, I actually read an article. I, I never oh, like chase a client, and I wasn't chasing, so I didn't take them to coffee, right? And they have had only raised $30,000 every year in their gala. And I called up and, I, and they were asking me, you know, if you want to come buy a ticket here, uh, we need more auction items. And I thought, ooh, there's a red flag. They're, they're desperate. Let me take them to coffee. So I found out they had 75 silent auction items and they were killing themselves. And they said, we can't afford you maybe next year. And I said, you can't afford to wait next year. I, I live just six blocks from where your event is going to be, and I am not sitting at home in my parka lounger when I can be in the sector of voting. So I made them a deal. And if you, you know, double your money, um, we'll just make it work for you. And guess what? They went from 30000 to $67,000 that first year. We did 128 the next year. 167, and then just before COVID, we got to $180,000. And this was a little school, just blocks from my kids' school, who raised hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. And guess what? Now they're winning too. And I can't tell you how great that made me feel. And it was less work for them. But one to many ask, right? Instead of chasing everybody and having them drink because they're thinking, if you get them drunk, they'll give more. No. If you have a really good reason for the parents to come together and give, you will receive more. So the one committee asked went something like this. We want to create an anti-bullying program and we want to have a full-time science teacher. And granted, not everybody in the town could come. Some people weren't there. But we said this. There are parents who aren't here. And this program is for all the children here. And all the children who aren't here. This is a program for everybody. And would you give a joyful gift at the $5,000 level? We started $5,000. Guess what? A bunch of parents said yes. And the momentum grew, and we offered the opportunity to give a joyful, loving gift at the $2,500 level. And we went on down that way, and that is how we made the money with the one to many ask. Because everybody knew what we were raising money for, and we could all get together and give the joyful gift. And this is the auction method of fundraising. Now, let me tell you how it can go really, really well. If you have phone bidding in the room, I don't like it. Let me tell you why. It activates the left side of the brain. And the joyful giving, you have to start and really think about technology. I like to remove technology and keep it all about the right side of the brain that people can be motivated. This is why this works at uh, Christie's and other places that sell art for millions and millions of dollars because it's emotional. If you have the right person asking for the money for the right reason, I can ask Edward, Edward, would you give $500 and he can just do it this easy? And I can say, thank you, Edward. $5,000. Edward, thank you so much. We have a leader in the crowd. Do I have another leader in the crowd at the $5,000 level? 
You think that's a little bit of easier fundraising than chasing people one on one? Did I say we had to have a rubber chicken dinner and have a cost of thousands of dollars a person? No. As a matter of fact, many of my clients, as we're moving forward with more donor enrollment, we're doing events in gardens at the camp where donors have never been and saving lots of money. We use strategic partnerships. So remember that tequila tasting? The reason it cost so little was that I reached out to a tequila manufacturer and I gave them the opportunity to be the exclusive tequila that night. Now, remember what I said, I don't like to take advantage of a small business or mid-size, any business for that matter. But I made sure that parents knew all year long that Trace Agave's tequila was the official tequila of the club. And if you just happen to be purchasing it, would you kindly look for that brand first? And then next year, he volunteered to do it again because we were the number one selling zip code of that tequila. So you have a responsibility then to also serve strategic partners and sponsors all year long, right? I don't like to just put a company name on something and we're all done, right? We're not going to sell the list, but we can certainly allow them to be a part of the community because the archetype of your people in your room should be ideal customers for that business. Wow, you see how we're thinking like a business and treating other businesses like our partner businesses. So, what are some of the challenges? You know, I know this job can be lonely and sad. And as much of an extrovert, I was reminded earlier today that I am, you can have some really low days in this business because, you know, you get connected to somebody saying no, right? You know, but I love it when people say no because it gives them a chance to be released to find another organization that can be a better match for them so they can say yes. And not everybody's going to be your ideal client. But what can you do to help your mindset? And so can we see Chicken Little, please? You guys are going to love this. I actually used this this morning. So look at Chicken Little versus Paul Revere. I, this earlier it was poverty versus prosperity. But I thought, you know, everybody's talking those words, but I wanted to think of something different that you could really embrace. And so, and I'll tell you, working with my nonprofits, being in nonprofits, one in particular, they had chicken little mindset all the time. They were apathetic. Sometimes they were arrogant about how we were going to do donor development. How about being dishonest about where the gifts are going to go? That just absolutely broke my heart, right? Uh, an ego, how about a fear of doing things differently? Uh, inferiority, jealous of development people, development person between development person. That is just destroying your organization. Uh, how about being greedy, having stress all the time? Um, hate having to go to the office because you just can't face another day. The cloud is following you. You regret what we did. We're worried about doing things differently. Does that sound, any little tiny bit of that sound familiar to anybody? Gosh, it made it really hard. And I'm going to be really vulnerable with you and say that there were days at one particular job that I would go out at my lunchtime and I wouldn't even eat lunch. I would cry in my car. It was that hard. But one day I realized that it was all of the mindset and it didn't matter what other people thought. I was going to still go out there and find those strategic partnerships and joyful givers. And so even this morning I got up and I, I looked at my, my chicken little and my Paul Revere. And I thought, which of these am I going to be? Today? Right? I want you to do this. Use this chart. And when you wake up in the morning, who are you? 
You're brave, calm, confident. You're going to delight in the work you do. You want to be enlightened, excited, forgiving. Forgiving. People mess up all the time. And you don't need to jump into your hula hoop with it, right? You got this imaginary hula hoop, and you're brave and confident, and you're loving life. And someone's going to jump and they're going to try to mess it up. Um, but let them stay in their circle, okay? And uh, you can live a life of joy, love, peace. And can you imagine if you equip yourself with this and you think like this that it is a disservice? not to allow interested donors the opportunity to make a joyful gift that will bring you abundance and elevate your organization. So what if you were Paul Revere? What if you were the evangelist for your nonprofit, right? And you don't need to own any of this stuff. People are going to say no, and it's okay. But you must dare to think differently and operate differently because I guarantee you, if you are continuing to do everything the way you did before pre-COVID, you're going to continue with those results or less. And if you do everything in your business, your nonprofit, the same way year after year, you could be absolutely guaranteed of the same results or less. But more abundance does not come from mediocre operations. And I see somebody in the back of the room that I just adore, Moni. Uh, you're somebody I'll bet that has a business coach and uh, is moving forward. You are getting out of the public square, telling how you serve, who those ideal clients are, and uh, you know what you do, Moni, is what everybody else should be doing and thinking. And I want to encourage you all to consider having a nonprofit advisor for your organization or a coach or a mentor because you need somebody different than the exhaust you're breathing in the office. Fresh air, fresh perspective. Elevate. Be ready for that big gift. Do you have a dream? Like what if a million dollars came to you? Do you know what happens when we get big gifts like that and you don't have a plan? That money gets squandered. It goes into the general fund and sometimes development thinks my work is done. I can take a break. But what you should be thinking is there's this off ramp we have going and if a big gift comes, we're gonna elevate and serve higher and serve more. Because when you don't plan like that, it's like, driving down a road with your organization and you have found a pothole and you have to stop and you're going to put some black top on that pothole so you can continue driving down that same road in the same direction and that is wasted resources let's see what i might have forgotten here one minute. let's talk about lifetime donor value Anybody ever heard of that? So I have a Venn diagram in my book. I think you're going to really like it. It has three circles, and in the very middle is a little tiny number four. But number one is frequency. Frequency is how often those gifts come, and are you thanking at a frequency, right? 90% of nonprofit professionals do not thank their donors. Wow. Donor acquisition, new client acquisition is incredibly expensive. And to squander that uh, means that you have also squandered their, what I call their like minded tigers. Because if you imagine a tiger in the jungle, all of his friends think like him. They kind of eat the same stuff. We're talking about archetypes here. And so if you squander a major donor, you have lost their connectivity to other like-minded people. And if you operate properly, there's this thing called referrals. And those are the very, very best donors, clients in a business there ever are. 
90% of my business is referral. And they're the very best people in the world. So let's talk about duration. Duration is the length of time that this person is on your books giving a gift of frequency. Does this make sense? And then there is level, the level of the gift. So $100 once a year times 20 years. How much is that, right? $2,000. $1,000 every month for 12 years is $144,000. Wow. $10,000 a year for 10 years, $120,000. So do you see now how there's a diverse, the diversity in income? And case point here, I, uh, I, I started a job at a, a major nonprofit and um, there was no onboarding. It was a little bit of an afterthought. And all I had was a list of lapsed donors. I love it. I mean, I put myself through college with both things, right? And so get on the phone, right? This was fun. But one of the things I did was go back and look at when was their very first gift? How much for the lifetime donor value if I added up the day from their first gift to now, how much would it be? And these were people who were missing for a couple of years. So you can always go back and see who did that, right? and uh, find out kind of what was going on with the organization, were they in the news, what was going on. But it didn't matter so much as the fact that I wanted to get in front of them, talk to them and say, we must have messed up. And uh, how can I help you help us? Well, there was a guy there with like a couple hundred thousand dollars and a lifetime donor value. And his, you're gonna love this, his donor birthday was like March 1st. That was the day he gave his very first gift. So I went to all of the lapsed donors and I found out when their donor birthday was. And the week before their donor birthday, I'd sent them a birthday card. Thank you for the many gifts you gave. This is your donor birthday, happy donor birthday. You have helped us 100,000 meals worth with your $200,000 lifetime gift. You are highly valuable, but how can I thank you now? Is that scary? That's Paul Revere. That's Paul Revere thinking, right? I'm not going to fear. We're going to go forth, and it would be a disservice not for me to recognize them and give them an opportunity to come back. So, this is kind of why I like the homecoming dance, right? We are going to have the next gala. And by the way, I found them because I was a guest at the gala and they had spent nearly $50,000 to raise way less than that. And this was an opportunity for me to come on board and change the reality. I just want a big challenge. Because I knew what I knew looking at the minutes of that event where they were losing money. And so this is why I offer it to other thing called event detective where you can hire me and I come in as a looking like a guest and I'll give you a report where you lost all your money. So this particular event, um, I invited some of these people because it was not threatening. May I buy you a ticket to our next event? I'd love you to come and see what it is we're doing. And they came and we, uh, were able to reinstall them, so to speak, as back to their old levels instantly. So lapsed donors are little treasure chests. Don't be afraid of them. They're very valuable people and you can bring them back with level, frequency, and pick up that duration. But don't mess it up again, right? I want to talk to you about why people leave nonprofit organizations. I don't think they leave the organizations, but they fire the people they're working with, right? 
and maybe the mindset. I would love it. I would love it if everybody could find a way to change the mindset in these organizations to think more like a business, to be looking at return on investment. Because when you leave, you drop the ball on those wonderful donors, and they're going to start wondering why somebody new comes in every 18 months to two years. It's terrible. So I really like to uh, come into an organization when I'm working with them and number one, try to get the mindset set. And it's something like this is when no matter who you ask in that room what their job is, they say, I am here to help, you know, lost dogs find their forever home with a loving family. Not I answer the phone as a receptionist. You're all part of the transformation. What if everybody thought like that, that you were all part of the transformation regardless of the job you did? Any questions? What kind of time do we have? Okay. What should nonprofit professionals look for in a coach or a mentor? Tell you what, find somebody who's got stellar results because you want to stand on the shoulders of that person, not somebody who's up here. Now, I love peer groups because iron sharpens iron and you can learn together. But find someone who's done the work you've done and they aren't just a theoretical experience of, you know, we want someone who's been in the trenches and they can share those experiences, case studies, results, and transfer skills to you. Transfer those skills so you too can succeed. Yes, Moni. Uh, everything that you said resonates so much. And I, I think that uh, oftentimes what I see in the nonprofit world, the business world, uh, is that the thinking is different that we, but we have what you said about the business. It is, I don't know, 5,000 times. Uh, it, it should be a percent. I agree with you that it should be about the business. So, and then, you know, we, you know, I look at my business all the time where I look at the SWOT analysis. Like right now I wrote eight ways that I, how I get my business. Of the eight ways, uh, the greatest one that I have is client appreciation. Thing. Well, nonprofit should be doing the same thing. Who's your top 20% that gives you 80% of the return or the top 10% that gives you 90% of the return? Should be bringing those people together all the time. But when you do an event, it has to be so special. How, how special is it? Do you have to think about how do you make it feel so special? That's when you just pick up the phone and call those people and get the money. It's so easy, in, in my opinion. So, I, I love that, Moni. You're 100% right. And what is the number one thing if my group, um, you know, we coach people, we're mentors. Um, I have a course called the Six Figure Fundraising Framework where I run you through eight weeks of training so you will know all of the pieces to do to scale and repeat, by the way, not scale. And then we're gonna reinvent it next year. Oh, heavens, no, you're gonna look at your numbers and you're gonna find out who your top people are. You're gonna replace seats that are bad real estate for people who came and gave nothing and more. So um, you're absolutely right. What is the one thing that I have? Well, I tell them, but they don't always do. What is the one number one thing that you should do after your donor enrollment event? How about have the board get on the phone the next morning? And I'm gonna take 30 minutes. Now they're all gonna resist because they're on the board because they wanna tell everybody they're on the board and there's no give and get. They just love saying I'm on the board. I know because I used to be on the board and I quit boards because people did that. It just drives me crazy. I'm a little type A, sorry. Um, pick up that phone and call. It will take 30 minutes max to call 10 people. Believe me, I know because I used to do phone sales. I know how to get off the phone and get what I need and uh, move you along. And fortunately, we don't do phone sales anymore at dinner time, but uh, I was really good at that. So get on that phone and say, Edward, thank you so much for coming last night to our event. We are so grateful for your support. I hope you had a wonderful, wonderful time. 
And uh, is there anything that you would like me, uh, some feedback or anything? And how could we make that a, a better event for you? And then listen. And chances are, if your event was Saturday night, you're calling on Sunday morning, and guess what? No one's going to answer the phone. Aren't you lucky? You can just say, Edward, I'm so sorry I missed you. I just want to say thank you so much for coming to our event. You helped us exceed our goals. The service that we are going to provide is elevated because of you. And if there's anything that I can do for you, or if you have any feedback for me, please just, here's my number. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll be following up with how your gift has made an impact. Oh, that was so hard, right? They don't answer. That takes 33 seconds, and you can do that times 10. You're done in 10 minutes, and now you can go out and sit in the lounge chair, and you have done something that 90% of other nonprofits have not done, and you think they're going to remember you next year. You can say yes. How are we doing on time? Oh, always want questions. Uh, so one from chat. Uh, can you please speak on how you might create level, frequency, and duration as part of the transformation of your volunteers to become monthly or annual donors? Yes. Uh, would you kindly put up the donor pyramid, please? So here's a little challenge with volunteers. And I love volunteers. Uh, first of all, I love being a volunteer because when you're a volunteer, you can do things and get into places and meet people that they would never hire you to do, right? Because you're not qualified. But if you're a volunteer, you can do all kinds of crazy things. And I have, I've like, I've driven a train. I drove a steam engine train because I was volunteering and I was in the right place. And I really have this like love for like, the machinery and driving things, right? So um, anyway, look at this. And imagine there's donors in some of these levels. Now, let's just be fair. Some donors are professional, I mean, I'm sorry, volunteers in this book. Some volunteers are professional volunteers because they never want to give money. And you can't get money out of some turnips, but some turnips are really, really helpful when they turn up at your event, right? So um, let's just kind of look at this. So you have transactional donors, and that's oftentimes where volunteers will start, right? Now, a transactional donor is a give and get kind of person. And it also, I would also put electronic giving there, like Giving Tuesday, like some big donors would give on Giving Tuesday. But I actually heard this this year, like, oh my gosh, you have to thank everybody from last year and get them to get a gift for Giving Tuesday. Isn't that terrible? There's, there's no uh, moving up the pyramid with that kind of an attitude. And that's chicken little, right? So transactional donors, um, those come because there's a give and a get. And, um, you know, your volunteers, I would keep them as enrolled as possible. But if they're not giving money, um, I, I don't really look at volunteers as people that I want to grab and hopefully turn them into a donor. It's a lot of effort and that may not be where they're coming from. Your best find more donors is from the donors you already have. So let's look up the pyramid. Um, still at transactional donors, uh, here's one. So um, at that booster club I told you about earlier, we really needed a bunch of money fast and so what could we give the community where we could reach out to the community that wasn't just parents? So I came up with this kooky plan called the Tri-Tip Barbecue on Super Bowl Saturday. Because I figured people could come buy a bunch of barbecue for Sunday. So that's how we sold it. Buy your dinner tonight and take care of tomorrow. And we didn't have money to do this thing. So I had all of the sports teams go out as salespeople and pre-sell the dinners at $50 a dinner. The cost was about 22. Each team got 10 for every dinner they sold. Way better than wrapping paper, huh? Now, I didn't want anybody getting out of the car, so it'd be a drive-through barbecue, and you just hold up your number, and if you bought five dinners, you get a bottle of wine. Are you seeing how easy this is? 
no money out of pocket, no waste because you pre-sold everything. We had the teens come in and prep the food at six in the morning. By noon, we're done. The food was all delivered. Transactional donors. This was the community that the families went out and found the extra donors so we could have a transaction. And this thing is still going to this day, believe it or not. And um, I don't even show up. I go buy dinner. Uh, but monthly and low level is the next level there. And I love monthly givers. They give you some income. But are you thanking those monthly givers so they can increase in level? Because if they stay at the same level, $10 a month, at the same frequency, $10 level, frequency once a month, duration a couple of years, you're not expanding them up to mid-level. And sometimes they get very forgotten. So we uh, that level there, sometimes that doesn't get any attention at all. So I would make sure that they're getting a newsletter and they're invited to some events. Um, then you have your mid-level and we decide what mid-level is. Uh, then we have donor enrollment. And the reason I put that there is I think that is its own level. It should be treated like its own level, and here's why. If you do a donor enrollment event, and I did not say expensive gala with a $30,000 sound system, which that is very, very common if you go to a hotel, uh, you want your major donors at that donor enrollment event, and you can recognize a legacy giver, and this is somebody who has probably given you $100,000 or more, put you in the will, they have a special pin that calls them a legacy donor. They get recognized. They come an hour early to meet with the brass. Now do you see how you've done everything in one event? And now they have lots of people to recognize at the major level and the legacy giver. And that legacy giver can come up and speak and say why you should give. And this is why I put them in my estate. So use an enrollment event to do many things not just have a chicken dinner to raise money. And if you didn't raise as much money as you wanted, it was a failure. That first one I did, I, you know, you only made $5,000. Well, the goal was 10, but the opportunity to scale and repeat, to let youth come up and talk about how their life has changed because of the investment in their transformation and allowing legacy and major donors to up level, did you hear that? Using them to up level, mid level up to major. And there's a lot of strategies we use. I go back and I will look at the numbers of what people gave in the previous years by paddle number, because I don't need to know your clients names. I like to respect that. What if, and I know I'm getting way deeper, but what if, Denise, you had 20 people giving a thousand dollars and only 12 giving 2,500. You have a big possibility of elevating those $1,000 donors to 2,500 with very little effort. In the moment, the one-to-many ask and in 35 minutes, you have cultivated everybody using legacy major donors, up-leveling, thanking, educating, informing, and having an event that is so good they want to come again, and what would be the most important thing they could do for you then? Referrals. Is that more than just a chicken dinner? We're maximizing, we're getting return on investment, and we're monetizing every minute. Any questions? One comment kind of uh, from chat uh, that kind of agrees with what you're saying is that those monthly donors uh, are frequently the most loyal and long term, but uh, and and generally have a lot more capacity, but are never asked. So are frequently the most overlooked. Yes, they uh, certainly are. And uh, because they're doing things long term, uh, they're probably the most likely ones to become potential legacy donors. Uh, and that will either put their organization, put your organization in their will or estate. 
Absolutely. So don't forget and overlook them. That's why this enrollment event is so important because they can come and be given the opportunity to up level. And they're going to hear how great it is uh, to be a legacy giver from a legacy giver and somebody giving greater. So, you know, you can think about uh, what your up level uh, gift for the night is. What would be some kind of way to recognize them in a separate event? You, you know, listen, you're in the best place in the world to have recognizing people. This is the most, like this is a haven on the planet. Oh, my goodness. Wouldn't you agree? And you have uh, your own wine country. So there's a lot of opportunity to partner with somebody and up level that. And uh, thank you for asking or uh, mentioning that about those monthly givers. You are absolutely right. I have uh, suggestions while I uh, you think that it worked for me and not only the business side, but the nonprofit side, is that um, the donor, your website, when it comes to donation, uh, I would suggest that you should include a couple people that are on there at the donation. First thing I do is I pick up the phone, like instantaneously. It's the greatest thing you can do is to pick up the phone and call that person and thank them as fast as possible. I, I tell you, it, it, oh my God, they're like so surprised. They're like, oh my God, I just, I just clicked the, the donate button. You just got the donation and boom, the phone number is there. If you have to contact or not, just get a hold of that person immediately and just call to say thank you. Oh my gosh, you would get so much more. So in case you didn't hear that um, on the Zoom, Moni, made a wonderful comment, and that is the minute you get that donation, pick up the phone, call them, and just say thank you. It works wonderfully. And so, um, do we have any other yeah. questions? So I was going to say, can you open it up the gallery on here and see if anybody online wants to participate, or if there's somebody in the room who wants to share some of their successes, or has would like to come up to the podium and share so that people on Zoom could hear as well. Can you put it on the gallery? I kind of felt you for that. I'm glad you pointed that out. I heard the question to be, how can you get volunteers to give more money? And, um, and I agree with you 100% that volunteers, um, you know, they may not be coming to give money, but uh, the time and effort they put in, uh, you know, I have an organization next door to my office, and they are 100% run by volunteers, and they wouldn't exist without volunteers. And although, you know, the executive director does ask me occasionally, like, how can I get them to donate? Um, what they're doing is priceless. And uh, this particular organization sends Bibles to individuals in prison. And they uh, mark up the Bibles and they put a gold name for that individual. Uh, in this particular case, this is the only item that a prisoner can have that has their real name on it. And so... Um, she wouldn't be able to pay people to do that. So sometimes, um, and, and agreed, some of your volunteers are going to be volunteers. And uh, that's priceless. Right. Right. I, I'm there for the purpose because I want to learn. I mean, I could be watching over right now or uh, at work right now, but I take time to come here to learn more. And it, it kind of takes a shell out of the Yes. I feel offended. I, I do. Well, I'm sorry yeah. for that. And uh, let me just uh, rephrase that uh, I believe the question was. Uh, how can you get volunteers to give 
money. And um, I wouldn't say that I would reach and expect, have any expectations beyond the wonderful gifts that they're already giving in time. And um, I, I remember at a one particular time, my job was to do uh, volunteer touring. And really it was to help them, like you say, become an ambassador and uh, see what it is that goes on behind the curtain with our organization. And uh, people would come from several companies to uh, just see what it is we do. And uh, we loved it when they could come and volunteer. And uh, it wasn't about the money with them. It was about, can they come and help in the kitchen? Because we couldn't possibly feed the thousands of people we did without getting the word out and having the opportunity for them too to be ambassadors and uh, pick up where we just couldn't possibly. And so um, what you shared with me really inspired me because uh, we could name a hundred events prior to this happening and invite the people in that share. Now, there wasn't very many that people that shared money because it was very new. We did a transactional uh, donor meeting where we did like a GoFundMe, um, but I can invite them back. And then it's more like um, about helping uh, helping students achieve the next level. So asking, instead of just saying, it was so impossible. So I want to thank you for that. I think that's going to make it something different. Um, and then also, I really appreciated how you um, shared the donor enrollment pyramid strategy and how you can maximize um, the levels of donors to reach the next. So it's really a strategy. And I can, I can see that working. So um, anyway, I just want to share that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what you said when it comes to the follow-up um, from the donors, because I think it is vital to continue to get those contributions from the donors that you're trying to, you know, increase the level to where they want to know where those results went to. So if you you know, give a progress report, you know, on a six month review, you know, we, we got $50,000 from you and this is where the money was spent and how that translated into hiring, you know, the person that you needed and it helped 10 kids, you know, advance their education, whatever the cause is. And I think if you continue to inform those folks, they're going to give you more and they're going to participate a lot more in the long-term, as, as she says, sustainability. We want to continue the long-term plan, and that's the way you need to approach it, not just the transactional or the short-term to meet the goal. Thanks, Gina. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right on that. So speaking of, Gina's with First Citizens Bank, and so we also have Steve McCoy-Thompson on the call, and Steve uh, works a lot with corporations. Steve, do you have any advice to offer on that point for working with businesses? Uh, hi, Kathy. <laughs> I was wondering if you would call on me. <laughs> so good to see you on the presentation. Do I need to turn my speaker up? Can you hear me? I'm working. Can you hear me? Okay, Steve, we'll be right back to you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Hello, hi. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Does someone else want to add anything like Steve thinks about it? Can you hear me? Uh, hang on a second. We're trying to change. Okay. Thank you. Maybe it doesn't work out then, right? If not everybody understands what we're there for. So that's a, a great uh, a 
realization there. When I uh, worked as a major gift officer, I had several small businesses as well as PG&E and some other very large companies. And the first conversation is, what is it you would like, um, how would you like us to appreciate you? What is it you would like to get out of this? Uh, we didn't know ahead of time. And um, it worked out splendidly. There's some case studies in the book too, how that just really uh, served both parties in a very large way. All right, let's try Steve again. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Is that a yeah? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, so yeah, great presentation. Thanks so much. Um, one is just a comment about the gatherings that you were talking about, which is a great idea. One thing that we do, uh, I'm the executive director of PPIE. Uh, we're the Education Foundation for Pleasanton. And one thing that we've done, that which is convenient, but is impactful, is we have a, we created a leadership circle for our top donors. And then a couple times a year, we invite them to a reception that piggybacks right after our board meeting. So it's a very, it's a convenient way for the board members. They just stay an extra hour or so. So it's not a big deal for them. And it's a way to invite these top end donors to build a relationship with the, um, with our board. And then we'll also, in our case, we'll invite school leadership as well. And so it's, it's, it's just a way to, to do those gatherings. And then just on the corporate level, um, you know, as you might imagine, uh, corporations are really concerned about return on investment, right? Uh, and so what we try to work with them on is like, how can we, you know, guarantee, you know, provide that in, you know, return. And they measure return often in, in terms of employee engagement, like how many volunteer hours are they going to get with their employees uh, for an activity or a project? Um, and then secondly, what kind of uh, community branding, if you will, will they get? And you know, a lot of what you said in terms of you know, just giving them shout outs is really important. So those are some of the tricks of our trade. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. your larger donors that you invite to one of these events are going to show up? Very high numbers because they like to come and they like to be recognized. And so um, I'm trying to think of some of them. I, I would, you know, it kind of depends on your organization and who they are, how old they are, but how far away they were. I've had people fly in across the country. It just, it just depends, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, even just a couple coming can really uh, move a row. Uh, just to add on to that, how important is it to continue a hybrid format like this, where it's virtual on Zoom and in person? And I personally hate planning hybrid events, and I think in person is so valuable because of that right brain planning opportunity. So what would you want to recommend? So um, I have people all over the country. I have people up in Oregon really loving this, but it's really the AV companies and the some of the people doing the program that like this program, this format so much. Uh, I think as a real uh, development opportunity to uh, allow volunteers to be part of recognize and the one-on-one -on -one with donors and that donor appreciation, and again, the physical giving and thanking, um, nothing beats live. And we're finding fewer and fewer, fewer people showing up who signed up to be in the virtual, where if they paid money to come to the live, um, we have about a 97% show up rate. But, um, I'm gonna add on what she said earlier too, like when you were asking people to, to attend, and that the best way to do it, I found, is that to make it that one is about relationship. Two is that making that per, per, per personal phone call, and it has to be repetitive. You know, you have to be on it. You know, but you gotta have a list. Like for me, I have a goal. Say, like I have five people to make a phone call a day. If I don't hear from them, I will check in, continue to check in, continue to check in. Am I right, Kathy? Yeah. You do this all the time. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And then and just by doing that, uh, you'll you'll build a relationship and per, per, your persistence will show you the way how you do your business as well. So. Absolutely. 
absolutely. And you know, these events, people think, oh, we're going to get expensive invitations. We're going to send them out. We're going to want to come. It goes like this. It's call, email, mail, or call. So remember that always in any kind of relationship building, call, email, call. Call says something like this. They're going to be getting something special in the mail. We hope you uh, are very excited. We're excited to have you come and we'll be checking in in a week or so to make sure you got it. So then if they get it, hope you got it. Uh, what do you think? Can we register you now? Uh, don't just leave it up to chance. People are so busy and went back um, in the day about the 80s and 90s. It was, we knew if seven touches was enough to get somebody's attention. It's now 23 because we're marketing above the noise. And other people aren't marketing by calling people one-on-one, -on -one, but you are. How do you like getting lots of texts? Yeah. I don't oh, think so. <laughs> I, I feel like people are, are trying to other, you know, I'm still getting some things that way. And I just want to make sure that that is not. No, I, I not agree correct. with you. Now, I don't mind a text the day of, like, hey, the silent auction online is closing in that one hour. Jump on in there. I'm like, oh, thanks for that. And I can. But uh, I, in the last two weeks, I've gotten so many texts from people I've never even heard of telling me to hurry up and buy something. And um, Wow, I really don't like that. I've received texts from people I know and like for events. Like, oh, here's this, don't forget to register. That's a different story. And I think that you could have people do that. But yeah, the generic, just throw it out there. It would really make me frustrated. Yeah, that personal invitation makes you feel good, you know? And the thank you, um, I, I say it like this, you know, your Aunt Mary always sends you a gift, right? When you're a kid, like you always get that $25 check. And what happens? How do you think she feels that you never thanked her? Or you're sending a check to your niece and you never got a thank you. Um, donors feel that way too. I mean, they don't just have money they want to throw away. And uh, I, I heard this just this week. I read an article where a little boy said, did anybody read this article? I, and I don't want to get it wrong, but I think he sent a bunch of organizations, a check for $10. And one organization sent him a handwritten note that said, you know, dear so-and-so, thank you for your gift. And it's gonna do this, that, and the other thing. And his mother followed up with a $400 gift. Now, isn't that interesting? Sorry? So, Good question. Those numbers should be in your donor uh, CRM, your portfolio. You some. Are we getting the organization? Are we getting the personal person? Uh, phone number? They're not going to want to be involved. So, do you get the secretary's phone number? Or who do you get? So, I'm talking about individuals, and like, we'll, we'll pick on Edward. Can I pick on you once more? So, Edward's a donor, and um, I know him because I thank him. And I call them a couple times a year to just to say, these are great things that are happening at the organization. I wanna thank you for your support. And so I have his number. I, I wouldn't call strangers and invite them. Um, if you handed me a, a list of three or four people that you want me to uh, invite, say, oh, these people would be great. I'll say, you know, your name. You know, Maria tells me that you might be interested in coming to our upcoming event. And uh, we're, we're grateful for her, for her support. And uh, we want to just make sure that you know about it. We'll be sending you an invitation in the mail. And as you build uh, relationships, you'll have, uh, I'll have Edward's phone number. Um, I had a mailman that used to send me money every month at the organization. And every month I picked up the phone and called him and he goes, I just love that you call me every month. And I have a feeling he was just a very lonely man and uh, he passed and left a large gift for the organization. And it just meant so much just for me to call. And I'd say, how are you feeling? How are you doing? We're so grateful for your gift. And he goes, one day he said, keep calling me and I'll keep sending money. Oh, we have Steve McCoy. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I had a question, actually. We are getting lots of promotions of... 
you know, software tools that you can use to reach out to, to potential donors. And one of those is a tool where if you click on that, our, our web, a web page, you're going to get an automatic email, right? As you know, asking for, you know, to build a relationship. And another is you say geofencing, right? I, I, you probably know how geofencing works. So do you think these are worthwhile investments? Um, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on that. So um, that's a good question. Um, in my industry, there are people writing software for everything. And it doesn't mean it's all good. Um, there's one particular piece of software now that you can get and it'll print out a bid card and it's gonna have a, uh, a QR code on it. And so when you give, you're gonna keep your arm in the air until somebody gets around and scans your card or scans your credit card. How, how do you think that makes a donor feel? So. Um, in the same way of an automated email, I think I really, well, I know I, I prefer, like Moni said, a phone call, because this is going to differentiate you from everybody else who bought the software. And so if I give a gift and somebody calls me, it's going to blow my mind. I'll say I'm a major giver at the Monterey Bay Aquarium because they just make me feel so special. And there was a time, and this is a, a little bit of a joke, but it's true, I told the Monterey Bay Aquarium that I hoped that, um, that I didn't uh, pass away before my children got out of school because they'd all have to go live at the aquarium because um, we're legacy givers there. And so there's nothing can beat the personal thank you and it is gonna make you different than anybody else. I have a couple from chat. Uh, and I'm actually gonna combine a couple questions and comments here. Uh, <clears throat> So the first one is how fancy or simple should the donor enrollment recognition event be? Should it just be a wine and cocktail or dinner or a barbecue? And I'm assuming that we do not charge a registration fee. Uh, I, I just wanna have a, and, and a secondary comment was, uh, apparently there's new legislation that starts July of this year that any volunteer or staff that serves alcohol at an event needs to be trained and certified. Uh, and that includes even one day event license permits. So that's something to check on. And also, if you're going to have some kind of auction or raffle, there are certain reporting filings that need to be done for that as well. So. True. So for events, I always uh, think that you should charge a ticket because this encourages people to show up. And so uh, we always sell a ticket. You can sell tables. If you sell a table, that means that your person is going to make sure that they get other people to fill those seats. And there's a lot of science and psychology behind it, that as well. So I do believe in that. And I also, um, the best method, you ever notice like the Christie's auction houses and stuff, people are seated so they can pay attention and listen. And so I like to have people seated. If you're in a circle, you can see everybody. And what happens is you have momentum and eye contact, and you can look at tables as teams sometimes um, in giving opportunities, right? So um, I think that answers the question. I, I, you know, you can spend as much or as little as you want, but spending more uh, isn't going to make somebody give more. So if you want to look at return on investment and monetizing your minutes, uh, you don't need to spend a lot. And um, like I said, that other little event we did um, with a $10 a head cost, uh, nothing wrong with that. If you're, you know, if you're charging $150 a head, you probably want to provide some special um, you know, champagne if that's what you're serving. Uh, and, you know, and certainly follow your county guidelines. But, uh, you know, you want to make it special. We want to make it nice. And you don't want the donor leaving thinking, wow, they certainly spent a lot of money to throw this event. And um, how much are they going to be left with for the cost? Thank you. So Denise just uh, had a successful fundraising um, or fundraising success. Denise, is there something that you would hear that uh, surprised you or something big that you learned that? Um, well, I think Moni said it when you oh, have you yeah, come, come up closer. Uh, we just 
how the capital campaign for the Vineyard Casino project, and uh, we received a four hundred fifty thousand dollar gift recently from the Senior Assistance Foundation, which is big, and that helped close out our campaign. So I'll be announcing it uh, publicly um, right now, but also <laughs> <laughs> more systematically um, this week. But um, I think Moni had said it to be persistent is key. Um, we actually had submitted our proposal about two years ago, um, and they were a funder of our senior meal program, uh, and the board chair had passed away. So we needed to reconnect with that board and re-educate them because our key relationship was gone. So um, staying persistent, keeping those relationships are very important. Does anyone else have any success or something they've learned they'd like to share? That's where a lot of our meetings kind of come alive if somebody has anything. No, anyone on Zoom? Any more questions out there? Okay, go ahead. I have a question I'm embarrassed to ask. Um, <laughs> um, uh, initially, you, you kind of uh, downplayed the value of the silent options, but mm -hmm. Then later in, in your discussion, you are talking about the value of silent options. So, and I understood the, you know, if that's all you're doing and you're missing all the other components that you're not going to see the same ROI. But um, tell me about it. Is there some something that I just didn't hear you say that connects the value and minimizes the amount of work that you were referring to um, around silent options? That's a great question, Terry. So think about a silent auction as taking up square footage and square inches and all this stuff in a room. We are spending a lot of money for square footage in a room. And so perhaps the best use for those square feet would be individual donors. And also, are we gonna be able to maximize when I get a gift from you and your small business, am I going to elevate your business and have it be very valuable to the crowd and so here's what I like to do with silent auctions now is get software where you can put the silent auction online, open it up a week before the event, open it up to the entire community, not just the people inside the room, and you can use it as a uh, springboard to bring people to the event, also to make a gift if they got outbid, and you see how now you've got greater return on investment and uh, the only thing is, is delivering that. So sometimes the best items to have in the silent auction are items that you can flat mail to people and not have to take a giant thing to them. So uh, that's how I would maximize return on investment. And thanks so much for asking that. For filling in that the space there. Thank you. Right. And uh, so we have the book. And you all can get a free download of the book instead of having to buy it on Amazon. So go to edikiso.com and just fill out the information. You'll be able to download the book. If you want to stay in my mailing list, we have lots of special offers that come that support people like you, information, and uh, just keep up the joyful opportunities to serve. And remember, it's a disservice not to offer the opportunities for people to partner with you and make joyful gifts for your prosperity. Thank you. Small token of our appreciation for coming out. So thank you. Appreciation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you everyone who came out and thanks for those of you on Zoom. Please yeah, check out our website, see what's going on and um, think about buying raffle tickets to support the um, Wine It Up event that's taking place in a couple of weeks. All those funds that we raise are going to go to the Tri-Valley Nonprofit Fund Grant Program. We started giving grants out. We have a grant program giving $25,000 per quarter. So all the raffle ticket money that is raised will go to support nonprofits in the community. So thank you again. A ribbon cutting one more time. And our ribbon cutting one more time. <laughs> Next Thursday, four o'clock is the ribbon cutting. We're at uh, some multi-ribbon cutting events. Some of our nonprofits who are housed there, Hively, 
First Breast Cancer <coughs> Foundation and Konami Tri-Valley will also be holding ribbon cuttings too. So it's going to be a big event and we'd love for you to come by. Our member mixer, as I said, will start at six o'clock that evening. So if you can't be there at four and you're a member of TVNGA, come by at six. We'd love to have you there. So thank you again, everybody.